HIV health uh, and pandemic planning. Uh, our first speaker uh, is Dr. Christian Sandrock, who will talk about technology and surge capacity. Uh, Dr. Sandrock. All right, so five minutes. I think I made you guys two slides, so I might even do less than that. So, um, keep it short, especially on a Friday afternoon. You never go long. Um, so my background, I am a physician and a public health person, so my technology knowledge is nearly zero. And uh, much of, I think, uh, your backgrounds I don't have. But the nice thing is uh, I can tell you where we would use technology and some of the issues we've had by lack of technology, which is kind of my, my point of uh, dealing and uh, working with this. So. One of the big things we have in pandemic planning and on the side of emergency preparedness is uh, coordination and coordination during a large event where we have an overwhelming number of patients. So that idea is surge or a surge uh, of patients and dealing with that capacity to handle it. And what we've seen over time is that uh, it gets really complicated. And we learn that with multiple disasters and we can talk about some of those examples. But really uh, these come up in a number of different issues, but mainly tracking patients across a region. So if you were to pick for example, we're here in Northern California. If we have to move patients from different healthcare facilities, different sites that have different needs, whether it's in the field or a school gymnasium set up to care for patients or hospitals, really tracking and following that patients, those patients become difficult. Very big issue, for example, after Hurricane Katrina because they shipped a number of patients up to places like Houston, Baton Rouge, and family members sometimes spend a month or two just find, trying to find out where mom went. Very difficult. The second issue that comes with that is the time and energy spent in logging those patients. So as they move from facility to facility, in a disaster, this is often a manual process. You have a manual log, you write it in a book, you spend your energy doing this. This is staff time that could be better used caring for patients and responding to the disaster rather than logging these patients in. So it's really a, become a big issue. Uh, with patients and just as patients, you can look at uh, another sort of uh, thing, which is resources. So any form of medical equipment we have, albeit medications, prophylaxis, vaccines, ventilators, these things need to be um, particularly tracked but also typed. So what that means is just as we're going to start sharing resources between the private and public sector and between public health and, and hospitals, these resources move back and forth. And normally what happens now, you have a bureaucrat who knows nothing about the equipment they're ordering. They get a call, for example, that you need more vaccines at UC Davis Medical Center. They type it into a computer, and it's, uh, it's written online. It has what's called a mission tracking number. So it's traced to UC Davis, and that's only for federal reimbursement. So if FEMA wants to pay us for the disaster, we need to have that number. So it's a purely financial thing. It's not tracking that improves you know, your outcome or like a UPS barcode. It has that number, and basically it goes, and it moves up the chain of command until they get it and it's put in a truck and driven there. But there's no real central feedback whether it gets there. Nobody knows that it's gotten there. If it does get there, they may not even know and not be aware of it. So it might arrive on our dock at UC Davis, but no one's notified in UC Davis that your vaccine has arrived. Classic examples of this were the fact that it took five days to get water one mile to the Superdome in New Orleans. They had no idea that it was there. There is zero resource tracking. The second thing is resource typing. So not all resource equipment is created equal. So for example, fire does this very well. If you're gonna order a fire truck or a fire um, unit or fire engine, they're very different things. And they'll say we need a type one, type two, type three. Those mean the same things throughout the country. On the medical side and the public health side, we do not have this. So we may ask for a ventilator and a bureaucrat who has no experiences typing in ventilator, they just hit return and buy the first thing they see and that may not meet our needs. And again, was a big issue and there's about 15 to 20 deaths linked to the wrong pieces of ventilator equipment that arrived at nursing homes during Hurricane Katrina. So again, they're not typed and they're not tracked appropriately. And then the last thing is interoperability. So what we have from a technology side is everybody's on their own. So what, what, county, what one county and one health facility may have does not at all meet with another county um, or health facility. And this goes across public and private and other sectors. So this becomes a very big issue. So if we see a patient from Kaiser and they show up with their medical records, we have to print them, we have to manually log them because it doesn't speak with any of our equipment. Their resources don't speak with any of our equipment. Those resources may literally, physically, those tubings may not hook up because they're not ordered or typed appropriately. So the big question we have then is how can technology and what can we do to work on some of those things? And oh, dear God, this is the problem when you have an apple and it's put on here. So never good, and I was hoping that wouldn't be the case. But um, I'll stop here and just talk so you can see the nice white screen. But essentially and ideally what's supposed to happen with that is that um, you actually can have this tracked with technologies such as RFID tags. So if every piece of equipment can have a tag, 
Every patient can have a tag. Every staff member can have a tag, and that can be resource typed. It would make things much easier, and it would be able to be centrally tracked. So if you were in a region such as Northern California and you had the disaster response team sitting there, they can look at an RFID tag number and know that this is not only a surgeon, this is a burn surgeon who's trained to take care of burns. They are located at UC Davis Medical Center. They're on the fifth floor in the burn ICU, and they're physically present in there. Or this is a ventilator. This is the type of ventilator it is. We know exactly where it is. We're able to keep track of that and follow that ventilator and uh, keep monitoring on this. And it really allows this where you're not spending your time re-logging it, re-entering it, retyping it in online. And as they move through wireless networks, they're continually registered so these patients are automatically followed over their long uh, swath of time or equipment and so forth. So this is really where our biggest breach in technology or difficulty with technology has come. And after our after action um, in disasters, whenever we look at drills or Hurricane Katrina, this is one of our biggest links. People always write down communication which is a big issue because nobody knows how to talk to each other, and I don't know if technology will ever improve that. If it does, I'm going to become a marriage counselor. But um, that's, what's, uh, that's the one difficult. But this would at least improve that communication because you wouldn't have to make five or six or eight or ten phone calls to find out if your ventilator came. You can look at one source. Everybody's looking at the same source. Everybody knows it's the same thing, and really that time is cut down and then can improve uh, the effort we give to patients and patient care. So that's – did I probably go over five minutes? Okay, so that's about – uh, the length of it. So I'll see if you guys have questions. So low on technology and hopefully higher on uh, doomsday stuff. So. <laughs> Hi. How do you associate an RFID with a particular person? Do you implant it in the person, or does the person uh, have to? Uh, because well, I mean, you could have an RFID that was uh, attached. Attached. So. Um, I know there's some people who probably won't like this, but so we have, um, I think, and I'm not, I don't know the technology well, but the Voiceras we have, are those essentially RFIDs? Uh, we had these smaller uh, Voiceras, which are very similar, but, but you could have, a, it's, yeah, so it uses a wireless network. So I would think it's the same, and we wouldn't really implant them, but they would wear it as a badge or, or a code. And um, what we often have in disasters, if you're part of a team, you wear a vest and it probably would be logged in the vest, and you're supposed to wear that vest for the entire time. And that would pretty much be it. I mean, you could have it on a pager or any other source. The voice errors I'm commenting, you know, we for a while in our ICU actually had one that we wore to, to, so they would know we were in the ICU a certain amount of time to meet criteria. I revolted against that and hung it in the ICU bathroom for 12 hours, so they thought I was there the entire time. Because physically I'm in the ICU all the time anyway. I don't have a choice to leave. They're critically ill. But it, uh, it, it, allows, uh, it allows that side of things. So we haven't worked that out yet. You know, for the other things, you just attach it to the equipment and it's forever labeled that way. So, okay. Sorry. Yes. Just wondering, um, how much do you think the RFIDs, are, first, are you looking at passive or active, and how much do you think it's really going to improve over a barcode or 2D barcode in terms of information? It's a great question, and I think um, nobody knows, and I think that's where the, where the future is going. Um, you know, people have used barcode technology, and we're seeing that a lot. Um, you guys may have talked about this earlier, showing up with uh, EMR and with medical records. And, you know, when you have the patient and the meds arrive with a barcode so it's matched, um, there's, there's not a lot of data. So people really haven't used it. And the hard thing with disasters is you go through the experience and then you sit back and talk about it. It's not a randomized trial. There's not something you can really study as well prospectively. So we try it out in drills. And so far, both of them have worked well in drills, but the RFID and the active technology side has really been very poorly studied. So that's one of the things we're going to try and uh, do here at Davis is, is get a better handle on it. But it's, it's very hard to know. My hunch is that even if they're able to wheel themselves in and no one touches it and you know the equipment's there and it's already registered itself on its own, that to me would save still some time of someone having to manually go over and enter the barcode. But would that make a difference? Hard to say. Hard to say. If not, we're here at the end, I take it still so. Oh, sorry. Um, what, what do you see as the major resistance towards implementing you know, RFID tags or things like this for disaster preparedness or relief? I think it's, uh, it's probably leadership. So you know, you, when you go to school uh, in public health, they talk about public health programs either being a top-down approach or a grassroots up. Everything for this has been grassroots up. So um, you, know, and you see this at a federal level. There's a lot of failure in this. And, we just talked about this yesterday on a federal call that, you know, I just asked a simple question, who at the federal level is responsible for this sort of surge capacity and health care response? And we had people from the White House, Homeland Security, um, you know, HHS, the CDC, 
and not one of them could answer the question. You know, so they don't have somebody that you can actually point and say, you know, FEMA doesn't say they're fully responsible. They're responsible for disasters, but are they responsible for health care? You know, who's taking the lead on this? And there really isn't anything, so it becomes a grassroots thing, which means it's very patchwork. So what they do in New Orleans is very different than California, is very different than New York. So then you have a lot of these interoperability issues. And I think, you know, someone might say barcodes are great, another one might say RFID, and then you have a lot of issues. So until there's data really favoring a system, I think it's very patchwork or, or leadership to take initiative. So that tends to be the biggest issues. So, all right. Good question? Great, thank you. One more question? One more. Oh, sorry. Yes. Question. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, is the primary application, once you have the RFID devices, is really tracking patients or is it something more like warnings of different kinds, uh, alert management um, that are tied to the type of patient, the disease, the chronic issues, whatever they are? Um, is it something more than that? Just, just to than just saying where the patients are. My hope it's going to be more, th more things. You know, yeah. we're at least what we're looking at here is going to be a bit more simple. My hope would it be it can be tied to, and we didn't talk about this, a whole disaster medical records. So you can have this, and that would follow the patient and come from a central location as well. So all their things like past medical history, allergies, and meds wouldn't have to be re-entered and dealt with. You know, and I think you know f that would be ideal as well. You know, the gentleman sitting next to you also would look at other things and, you know, features and responses such as hand washing, whether people have done surgery, how they've done surgery, things like this. And, I, you know, whether the patient has had a procedure, you know, and this procedure has occurred, whether that piece of equipment has arrived, things like this, I think, are also involved with that. So it's more than just the patient getting there. It might be interventions as well. But, you know, I'm just, we're just in the be beginning baby steps, so I don't know how far we've gotten. All right. Thanks.